Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Thursday the 15th of December. Now, I've been meaning to remember for ages, but I keep forgetting at the end of the video, but a lot of you have been asking about the, uh, the posters. So we've been reduced to producing asinine uh, posters. Uh, now, these are available for uh, completely free download, so you can print your own if you like. Uh, Simon's provided us with these at all at high resolution. This one is I think, therefore I am. I think this is a picture of my frozen city here. And, uh, oh no, sorry, it's uh, when I'm allowed. So I think when I'm allowed. Um, and as well as that, as, as well as downloading these um, more seriously, uh, you can download my textbooks in PDFs completely free. Um, so this is the, the Physiology Notes book, and it contains all the basic, well, pretty well all the basic physiology of the body. And this one is the, all the basic disease processes, pathophysiology of the body. So you can download these and print them up and look at the diagrams and colour them in or do whatever you like. Completely free PDF downloads. And I, I made the posters available there as well, if you'd like the posters, all the copyright free uh, available. Now... Um, Having said that, let's get on to what we're talking about now. Um, but before we do that, I've had lots of questions on my uh, personal intake over winter. So you can probably see from my attire, it's minus, well, you can't see from my attire, but it's actually minus 10 here tonight. And um, if you live in the UK, you'll know how expensive uh, heating has been. Um, so we're trying to keep warm uh, as best we can in our houses at the moment. Um, but a lot of people have asked me about my personal intake during uh, winter. Um, and um, I'm going to share it with you now. Um, so personally, I take 4,000 units of uh, vitamin D a day. That's 100 micrograms of vitamin D. At this time of year, basically, you're making none at all in the sunshine. And I'm totally convinced it's necessary for a normal immune system. So I supplement it throughout winter. And my personal choice is 4,000 international units a day, which the um, the... the the authorities in the UK do say that's a safe level. It's it's actually a reasonably low level, but uh, that's what I take. And uh, um, take uh, some K2 as well. Um, I average about 100 micrograms of that a day. Now, if you're eating a lot of fermented foods, um, which we don't really get in my area very much, but if you are eating fermented foods, you probably won't need the vitamin K2 supplement. But if you're not eating the fermented foods, it helps the calcium go into the bones and keep out of the tissues. And uh, the fat-soluble vitamins are ADEC, A, D, E, and uh, K. So um, I take them with food because they're both fat-soluble uh, vitamins. Now, the other thing I take uh, most days when I remember, most days, 15 milligrams of zinc. Again, a relatively low dose. And here, um, let me just give you one example. The role of zinc in antiviral immunity. This is from Advances in Nutrition. Check it out for your reference. An abundance of evidence has accumulated over the past 50 years to demonstrate the antiviral activity of zinc against a variety of viruses via numerous mechanisms. And uh, I don't eat a huge amount of meat, so um, I, uh, I tend to take the, the zinc uh, to supplement that for immunity and, and other, other reasons. I also try and have a, a varied high plant diet, uh, thanks to... Professor Spector, who's advised this for me uh, because of the microbiome. And vitamin C is important, but personally I eat some oranges and some tomatoes, so I think I get enough vitamin C, so I don't, uh, I don't supplement vitamin C. I don't think I need to do that. Um, and um, obviously no, many, not virtually no one smokes anymore. Uh, if you'd smoked at my age, you probably wouldn't be here by now. And uh, I don't drink alcohol, apart from the times I, I do. Um, now, let's get on to the serious matter now of uh, China. Now, China, of course, the, the pandemic started in China and the pandemic is essentially finishing in China in that China is the last country to go uh, endemic. And what's happening in China at the moment, we believe almost certainly from all the data we can put together is exponential growth. I think everyone in China, virtually everyone in China, is going to be exposed to SARS coronavirus too this week, next week, the week after. In, in the next few weeks, basically, is what is, uh, is, what is happening. So, um, this is, this, so th th there's a few references about China. Hard to get news. Um, this is Global Times and Asia Times, which are fairly reasonable sources. Um, 
Now, the Omicron, what's called the BF7, which is actually the, 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 the BA5217 variant, uh, seems to be taking off in uh, China. It's a sublineage of Omicron BA5, so it's a constant evolution. BA4, 5, 5 is still prevalent here. We know, we know the story. The wild type was superseded by the Alpha variant, then by the Delta variant, uh, and then uh, by the Omicron variant. And now there's all these Omicron sub-variants. Well, it looks like this particular one is there in China. Now, in a sense, this is encouraging because it means nothing has really replaced Omicron. These are all sub-variants of Omicron which does have a lower pathogenicity than the original viruses, which is producing an awful lot of immunity uh, around the world uh, without, well, it's causing some deaths, and there, there, will be, there will be deaths in China over the next few weeks, I'm afraid. Um, but there's no alternative. This virus is becoming endemic. You can't hide from it. We can't stop it. We realised that a long time ago. Uh, the Chinese have been very slow. So that's the main variant spreading in in uh, Beijing. This uh, this BF seven, which is actually short for BA five two one seven, as we said. Now this is this is the China Daily. Now this is kind of a, as far as I can tell, it's kind of a, an official, semi official sort of Chinese uh, communication. So uh, this is the English language version. So it is kind of giving pretty well the official version. Of events but we can learn quite a lot from it and certainly learn a lot about Chinese thinking from it. Um, this is Dr Lai, Chief Physician at Beijing Infectious Diseases, U Yuan Hospital. So how infectious is uh, BF7, he was asked? Much more contagious than any of the other Omicrons is the answer and I believe this is completely true because it's taking over in China. It seems to be out-competing the other ones. Stronger immune evasion potential. So it evades immunity from previous infection, yeah, and vaccines, yes, it evades immunity from both. But uh, previous infection, of course, we know is associated with reduced chances of severe illness uh, and uh, and death. Um, shorter incubation period. So the incubation period has got progressively shorter all the way through this pandemic. Quite fascinating, really, to look at how this uh, single virus, and it was a single virus, it started off as a single virus. There was only two variants in the very early virus, and it did come from one place. And it was basically a single virus with two variants at the very start. The first sequencing revealed two variants. From that, it's just exploded into all these uh, different variants that we've seen, thankfully becoming less pathogenic as it's gone along. Uh, faster transmission speed. Now, the R0, the basic reproductive number that I think we're all familiar with now, Delta, well, the original, the original one, the original Wuhan one was usually quoted as 2.4, the R0. Uh, each person infected 2.4 others without particular uh, restrictions. Delta, it was 5 to 6. The R0 was 5 to 6. With the BF7, it's 10 to 18.6. Uh, so, wow. It is, it is incredibly transmissible, incredibly infectious. Each person could infect 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18.6 people uh, in an unmitigated situation. Incredibly, incredibly transmissible. Absolutely amazing. Uh, so most infectious uh, Omicron variant yet, and therefore most infectious SARS coronavirus 2 yet. Um, and uh, the doc, doc, Dr. Lai said, uh, causing larger difficulty in endemic and prevention control. Well, yeah, I should think so. But basically, we can't control it. All the Chinese can hope to do is slow the spread down a little bit. But with our noughts of 10 to 18.6, that is going to be remarkably difficult. It really reinforces the contention that we've been making on this channel for ages now that the Chinese can't contain this. And the only way to... The, the only way to progress it is to learn to live with it. It, it, is, it is, uh, is endemic. They, they have to learn to live with the virus as we do. Uh, why does the number keep going? Uh, people begin viral shedding one day after contact. Now, this is an infectious diseases consultant, and th this isn't a, a party political point, so no reason to question his word there. So this is not after infection. This is after contact, while the infection is still establishing. So... 
people are going to start shedding the virus therefore transmissible one day after they themselves have come into contact with the virus quite incredible levels of transmissibility second generation cases may appear within two to three days wow really really fast generation time of course that means testing basically probably won't pick it up uh, time for infected people to turn negative still about seven to ten days so um same longevity of uh, transmission or uh, viral shedding but starting much earlier viral shedding much earlier and we believe that the viruses are shed in larger amounts as well because it's primarily an upper respiratory uh, condition uh, symptoms are generally mild thankfully uh, many infections show uh, many, many infections show mild or no symptoms so lots of asymptomatics according to dr Lai. Now that's why it's important to find the infected and cut transmission chain as soon as possible. I agree, but all he can do is slow it down. He cannot stop it. Nothing can stop it. All he can do is slow it down. Or oh, as Boris Johnson fairly famously said, flatten the sombrero. So instead of having a big peak, you can have a sort of more rounded peak. That is all you can do. The Chinese must live with this as we are major symptoms so now interesting he's put fever there now this is an infectious diseases doctor working in a infectious diseases hospital so i suspect he sees more fever from the zoe data that we have in the uk fever is actually quite an uncommon symptom now uh coughing yes sore throat very much so decreased sense of smell and taste less so in the uk more apparently in china diarrhea and vomiting does occur but is not common asymptomatics uh, cases usually don't uh, need medicine or medical treatment fairly obvious but that's what he said high-risk groups of course the same elderly um, other diseases smokers obesity we know is a big big risk factor for all SARS coronavirus too and he also says later stages in pregnancy which okay he's, he's the doctor on the ground we will listen to what he says so we'll monitor their situation more closely sure for sure um beijing treats in accordance with the symptoms now antipyretics and painkillers to help uh, patients with fever or coughing now i assume here is just basically talking to lay people because i'm sure he doesn't believe that painkillers are going to help with cough painkillers do not uh, help with uh, coughing usually apart from perhaps uh, morphine which i don't think he's going to be uh, giving antipyretics are things that reduce fever opinions divided on this i believe that fever is a natural immune response and try not to treat fever in adults when i can avoid it believing that the febrile response is going to aid the immunological uh, response um, but that's what he reports um, personally i try and avoid uh, antipyretics during fever because i believe it's a natural healthy response fever doesn't just happen it's generated by particular mechanisms that are released by uh, white cells in response to infection pyrogens cytokines that go to the hypo hypothalamus deliberately alter the set point of the hypothalamus fever is not an accident it's a it's an intrinsic aspect of human physiology i think you can read about it in uh one of these books i think it's maybe this one i think it's in that one <laughs> um but so personally i try not to treat fever in uh, in adults um now um people with high risk uh, he says they use antiviral drugs don't know what they are because as far as i know the chinese don't have access to western antiviral drugs so what antiviral drugs is dr Lai using uh, i would love to know um most asymptomatic cases quarantine at home yes uh question about masks so as far as i know we still have no uh trial data to show that masks uh, are particularly effective they could reduce transmission for a period of time to some extent with some viruses some bacteria but of course we can't stop it altogether um and personally i take no precautions now because i think the more often i'm reinfected the better my immunity is going to be so i don't personally take particular precautions now but uh, but there again um i don't have any particular high risk factors either
So that's just what I do. Can't advise you. Um, virus mainly uh, reproduced. This is Dr. Lai again through the upper respiratory tract, consistent with the other Omicrons. Now, if it's in the upper respiratory tract, it's going to stimulate mucosal immunity. And hopefully it's going to do that before it gets down into the alveoli, into the lower parts of the lungs. So it's going to be mostly in the upper respiratory tract, as the other common cold coronaviruses are, as other rhinoviruses are that cause colds. This is the big part of the reason why it's not causing systemic illness as much as previous <coughs> as much as previous variants did. So um, that is the really good news about Omicron. Able to spread the virus, coughing, speaking loudly, of course. It's a very highly contagious virus. Uh, medical nursing masks not as airtight and effective as N95 and KN95 masks, he says. Of course, we've got to bear in mind that um, mask wearing is very cultural in China. And until recently, has been a legal requirement, so we wouldn't expect that to die out entirely. I think what we're seeing is a bit of a transition in thinking in China, which is good. Uh, Beijing continues uh, to make prevention and control measures more scientific, rational, targeted and effective. Well, all they're going to do is slow it down. Are they more scientific than they were? Yes, the zero COVID policy was ludicrous. More rational? Yes, the zero COVID policy was use, uh, useless, targeted. Uh, well, it was targeted before. I don't know quite what they mean by that. Uh, effective, all they'll do is slow it down. So um, quite interesting, really. Um, in a few weeks, certainly in a couple of months, China's going to be the same as everywhere else. But in the meantime, a proportion of people, those at higher risk in China, are going to get sick and there are going to be deaths. Whether we'll ever get the numbers on that is questionable. Now, let's just finish off with some thinking from the World Health Organization today. Now, this is just from their report yesterday. Now, um, of course, we're not allowed to disagree with things that the World Health Organization says, but there again, I'm not obliged to report them all either. So I've selected a few things to report. Um, as, as we look uh, to end this emergency, we still need to understand how it began. Interesting. So this is the WHO still want to know how the virus began. Now, it's patently obvious to me that it began from a, some sort of laboratory scientific incident. So there's no question in my mind about that. We've looked at that numerous times. It had a single origin, not multiple origins. A naturally occurring virus would pop out of the animal reservoir in several places at several times. This began at one place in one time. And uh, it just so happened to begin a few miles from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So uh, I, think, I think the World Health Organization know that. But of course, the WHO are somewhat dependent on Chinese um, political support. So they're probably not going to come right out, right out and say it. But I'm surprised that they are being as vocal as they are. We need to understand how it began. I agree with the WHO on that one. We continue to call on China to share data and uh, conduct the studies that we requested to better understand the origins of the virus. I agree, we need to understand the origins of this virus. And uh, who was involved in the origins of this virus, that they may be educated uh, to prevent future uh, events or other repercussions of the uh, whatever happened so who there pretty strong language for the who and remember this is this is who diplomatic speak so really this is quite strong quite strong language and convinces me that the who have their suspicions shall we say at least as I've said many times, this is Dr. Tedros, all hypotheses remain on the table. So clearly leaving open the possibility of a lab leak, uh, as well as natural zoonotic transmission. One of the most important lessons of the pandemic is that all countries need to strengthen their public health systems, motherhood and apple pie, of course, to prepare for, prevent, detect, respond rapidly to outbreaks, endemics and pandemics. Nothing to disagree with there, of course. An advanced medical system is not the same thing as a strong public health system. Absolutely true. So in the UK at the moment, the health service really is in quite a mess. Uh, it's advanced in many ways, but it's not particularly effective in many ways either. So I thought that was quite a wise saying, actually. An advanced medical care system is not the same thing as a strong 
public health system public health focusing largely on out of hospital care but it, it, it's still a valid still a valid point other things uh, from this uh, one of the other key lessons of the pandemic is the need for much stronger cooperation and collaboration of course again motherhood and apple pie there rather than the competition and confusion that mark the global response to covid19 so really quite frank international admission there of failure because we saw competition and confusion and some people might even say that the confusion was partly generated by the who of course we're not saying that um so yeah some some interesting things from the who there a little surprised just a few other things uh what they're now calling mpox what we call monkeypox of course 82,000 cases, 110 countries, 65 deaths. Weekly reported cases declined 90% since July. Now, this is what we expected on this channel. We thought it wasn't going to be a pandemic. Um, and we, we're not going to go into that again now. We, we have looked at the, uh, the nature of spread. And uh, from that, we conclude that it wouldn't be a pandemic and the transmissibility of the virus. And we've been proved correct. Will it bumble along at lower rates for some time to come? Probably. A bowler outbreak in Uganda, one of the hemorrhagic fevers, of course. Uh, no new cases in the past two weeks. Remarkably good news. But the Greater Horn of Africa, severe drought, acute health and hunger crisis. 47 million people now facing hunger. So a humanitarian disaster about to unfold in uh, the Horn of Africa. While the world is distracted by the war in Ukraine and the World Cup. Uh, we really need a much more international perspective on our healthcare. So um, we'll leave that there for now. Um, bear in mind the downloads, they're all free. Just download, download the posters, print them out, put them on the back of your bedroom door or whatever you like, or put them on your computer, completely free, public domain, all original photographs from Simon. I actually really like them. They're all they're all really uh, high resolution as well. So um, you, know, you can like zoom into things. <laughs> it's actually a scene from uh, where I live. You can see the cold in the air, can't you? It's, um... Okay, that's us for uh, now. Uh, keep warm, stay safe. Thank you for watching.